It was the summer of 1940, and against all common sense, Hitler opened a war of two fronts. The Red Army soldiers were surprised, but not entirely taken off guard, for they were in position along an impossibly long front line. However, many dispersed units learned of the incoming enemy invasion a little too late. One day, as his comrades risked their lives on a nearby battlefield, Soviet Army cook Ivan Pavlovich Sereda was ordered to stay in the encampment and prepare dinner for those who returned. While he executed his basic but vital task, he heard the noise of vehicles approaching. Three tanks rolled towards his kitchen, and a stunned Sereda noticed the white cross emblems on their sides. Then, as two of the German panzers passed him by, the cook quickly found shelter. But the danger was not over, and as the third panzer advanced towards him, Sereda looked around and grabbed the only weapon in his reach, a firewood axe. He would not let the Germans take over without a fight. War of the Races As documented in his political manifesto and autobiography, Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler planned to invade the Soviet Union within the first quarter of the 20th century. In his vision, he asserted that German people needed to secure Lebensraum, or living space, that would ensure their survival for generations. Then, in early 1939, months before the outbreak of World War II, the Führer told his army commanders that the next war would be, quote, purely a war of Weltanschauungen, worldviews, totally a people's war. Nazi ideology, specifically its racial policy, portrayed all Eastern Europe as a land occupied by subhumans, or non-Aryan Untermenschen. Furthermore, the corrupted territories were ruled by Jewish Bolsheviks, the two most despised enemies of the Third Reich. In his infamous book, Hitler claimed that Germany's destiny was to, quote, turn to the East as it did 600 years ago. Although somewhat secretive, several documents show how Nazi policies sought the assassination, deportation, or enslavement of the vast majority of Russian and other Slavic populations to replace them with pure Germanic peoples. In a 1940 secret memorandum by Heinrich Himmler, titled Reflections on the Treatment of Peoples of Alien Races in the East. The author outlined a Germanization procedure for the East and detailed plans for the Slavic populations. Himmler maintained the cleansing would be completed when, quote, in the East dwell only men with truly German, Germanic blood. Shortly after, in 1941, the secret General Plan for the East, or General Plan Ost, was prepared, comprising a so-called new order of ethnographical relations in the occupied territories. The procedure was twofold. First, a small plan, Kleine Planung, covered the actions that would take place during wartime. Then, after the war was won, the larger Grosse Planung would be implemented gradually for about three decades. As stated by General Erich Heppner, the Germans were fighting in the name of Europe as a whole, and the war against the Soviet Union was, quote, an essential part of the Designskampf, the German people's struggle for existence. And what's more, quote, the struggle must aim at the annihilation of today's Russia, and must, therefore, be waged with unparalleled harshness. Central to Nazi ideology, racial motivations strongly galvanized the planning for Operation Barbarossa, as Jews and Communists were regarded as equivalent enemies of the Third Reich. The regime's imperialist ambitions dismissed the supposedly inferior group's shared humanity and declared a Vernichtungskrieg, or a war of annihilation. Two Fronts Two years prior to the invasion of the Soviet Union, both sides signed political and economic agreements for strategic purposes. But beneath the apparent cordial relations between Berlin and Moscow, deep hatred grew with each passing day. Then, in July of 1940, the Soviet Union occupied Bessarabia and northern Bukovina in Romania, and shortly after, the German High Command began plotting the invasion of the northern giant. By the end of that year, Hitler authorized the implementation of the plan. Over the course of Operation Otto, over 3.8 million Axis personnel, the largest invasion force in history, mobilized toward the Western Soviet Union along a 1,800-mile front for non-combat operations. The episode marked the escalation of the war in geographic terms, but also solidified the Allied coalition, including the Soviet Union. Thus, the Eastern Front was opened, with no less than 600,000 motor vehicles and another 600,000 horses. Eventually, the region would see some of the most massive battles in its history, as well as the most terrible atrocities. And the number of casualties would exceed what both sides had ever experienced before. As the tensions on the border escalated, the German armies would capture about 5 million Red Army troops. To make matters worse, 
The Nazi forces deliberately starved or otherwise executed more than three million prisoners of war and millions of civilians. Meanwhile, political and military leaders drafted a plan to implement Nazi Germany's ideological objectives. Named after 12th century Holy Roman Emperor and German King Frederick Barbarossa, Operation Barbarossa called for the Nazis to take over the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941. Early that year, Nazi troops began assembling on the Romanian-Soviet border as the Luftwaffe flew surveillance missions over the Soviet Union. Although the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, remained suspicious of the Germans' intentions, he was reluctant to believe an invasion was imminent. With Germany engaged west with the British, it seemed impossible that Hitler would open another theater in the east. But on Sunday, June 22nd, the unimaginable happened. The Soviet military went on high alert, and around 1 a.m., all forces were mobilized for combat. Two hours later, the Germans crossed the border and launched the invasion. But many Soviet units on the front line received the warning too late, or did not receive it at all, due to a lousy communications infrastructure. Still, by noon, most of the unaware Soviet population learned of the danger from a radio announcement by Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov. As some three million German elements made their way into the motherland, a smaller Soviet force would come to meet them, and they would have to deploy every single element at their disposal, even a humble cook. Call to Arms Ivan Pavlovich Sereda was born on July 1, 1919, in the Ukrainian village of Oleksandrivka, now part of the city of Kramatorsk. His peasant family then moved to the bigger village of Galitsinovka, looking for better opportunities. As a young man, Sereda opted out of college and instead enrolled in the Donetsk Food Training Center. He wanted to become a cook, and upon graduating, he would indeed become one, but not in the way he had imagined. Early in World War II, in November of 1939, Sereda was drafted into the Red Army. He underwent training and was later assigned to the 91st Tank Regiment, 46th Tank Division of the 21st Mechanized Corps. There, he would offer his culinary services to a starving army. Despite their low status within the military hierarchy, cooks were a vital part of the war effort, for they did not merely feed the weary troops, but also boosted their morale. But one day, Sereda followed a higher call and distinguished himself for his valor against the brutal and relentless enemy in times of need. In only the second week of the war, the 21st Mechanized Corps of Major General Lyushenko were holding their positions on the northwestern front near Dvinsk. After an unsuccessful attempt to recapture the city, the unit was struggling to prevent the Germans' 55th Corps from breaking through their lines and into operational space. In his memoirs, fellow soldier V. Bezvetelnove recalled that on June 30th, quote, the Germans fell especially hard, tanks and self-propelled guns pulled up. There was a threat of encirclement. A liaison officer ran to the economic platoon, which was stationed in a hollow, and transmitted the order of the battalion commander to advance the combat positions and repulse the attack on the left flank. The platoon commander led the fighters to carry out a combat mission, ordering Ivan to provide security and food for the personnel. Left alone in the encampment with his porridge, Corporal Sereda wished he could be of service to his comrades, but in Bezvitelnova's words, quote, the order in war is the law. Suddenly, Sereda heard something. Three tanks rolled in line were coming towards him, and the cook wondered how many men he would have to feed. Then an abrupt realization hit him. Those were not Red Army tanks. They were fascists, with their white crosses proudly displayed on their sides. The right thing to do. The cook quickly unharnessed the horses and led them to a nearby fishing line. Then he hid behind the kitchen, hoping to go unnoticed. Indeed, two of the tanks passed by unconcerned with the encampment, but the third advanced imposingly toward his hiding spot. As its hatch cover snapped open and a tanker leaned out, a delighted German soldier observed the abandoned kitchen and cackled triumphantly, admiring the many supplies. At that moment, the cook was overtaken by adrenaline and grabbed an axe that was used to chop firewood. Without hesitating, he sprinted towards the German tank while yelling at the top of his lungs. As the frightened German tanker saw the screaming, maniac figure charging toward him, he climbed back into the hatch and closed the lid. Within seconds, the tank opened machine gun fire, but the cook was already on top of the tank by then. Sereda then pummeled the gun barrel with his axe and hacked away at it until it bent. Subsequently, the Germans revved the tank up to escape, but Sereda stuffed the peepholes with a piece of tarpaulin to halt the Germans' view of the outside. The brave cook then carried on with his hammering while he pretended to ask his comrades to throw tank grenades. He would then answer back using different voices, running around the tank as he hit it with his axe. 
Terrified and thought to be outnumbered, the Germans finally surrendered. A hero. The German soldiers got out of the tank at rifle point with raised hands, and Sereda then ordered them to tie each other. When his platoon completed their mission and returned to the camp, they were astonished to find a captured German panzer and four lined up soldiers in the kitchen. Major General Lyushenko was impressed, saying, quote, With his brave actions, he set an outstanding example of heroism. Sereda was subsequently appointed a scout. Within weeks of his first exploit, the cook turned hero came across yet another German tank chasing after a group of his comrades. As the vehicle stopped to reconnoiter, Sereda made his way to the tank and threw a grenade inside. After the blow, he climbed into the cabin and fired at the remaining German forces before they were able to react, forcing them to surrender. For this extraordinary feat, Sereda was promoted to platoon commander of the 4th Infantry Regiment, 46th Infantry Division of the 1st Shock Army. Having proven impressive skills, Sereda continued to serve with the Red Army throughout the war, seeing combat in the Siege of Leningrad that fall, and later in the Battle of Moscow until early 1942. By the time he was discharged at the end of the war, Sereda held the rank of lieutenant. Among several awards, he was named Hero of the Soviet Union and was bestowed with the Order of Lenin. Unfortunately, his time in the war effort took a massive toll on his body, and shortly after World War II, the legendary soldier passed away from his injuries and ill health at the age of 31. Thank you for watching our video. Please let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to hit the like button. Also, for more epic adventures from the annals of military history, subscribe to all of our Dark Documentaries channels, and hit the bell icon to get notified about our newest content. Stay tuned.